It's the Agribusiness Report. I'm Tony St. James. We're joined today by the Honorable Kat Kamek. She represents the 3rd Congressional District of Florida. When we talk about the 3rd Congressional District, for those who haven't spent a lot of time, how do we describe it? Oh, man. Well, it's the best district in Florida, of course, but it's the Gator Nation, or as some people call it, Title Town. Uh, you know, obviously being home to the University of Florida Gators, it's a huge honor. But if you go outside of Gainesville, you find an incredible district where we have aquaculture and we have equine, timber, dairies, um, some incredible farmland where we produce a variety of different crops. and. It's just great hometown, um, old school type communities. And um, so I'm very blessed to have what I call the best part of Florida. You mentioned some crops. Yes. When it comes to crops, uh, we've been able to increase productivity in the U.S. due to things like fertilizer. Mm -hmm. But fertilizer today has, well, there, there's, uh, there's an asterisk beside it. What are you watching when it comes to fertilizer? I think everyone's watching two major things, right? Availability and cost. So there's a number of factors at play here. Bad trade deals, uh, the war uh, that uh, Russia is waging in Ukraine, um, restrictions, regulatory issues here in the United States that are preventing more domestic production. But when you look at the inputs for our ag sector collectively, you know, you have um, potash, you have urea, you've got your nitrogen, you, 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 you really are dealing with a global market and a global marketplace of, um, of these critical inputs. Look at Russia and, and Belarus, for example. They, they have the lion's share of potash, but you see what's going on now. There's restrictions in trade, there's sanctions, and how does that impact us? Well, we, of course, have phosphate in Florida. Um, in fact, I have um, some operations within my own district, but they're being restricted because of an overly aggressive regulatory regime here in Washington, D.C. So all of a sudden, back home, our producers, who typically plan out a year in advance, right, they're thinking, well, maybe next year I'm going to just pull back. Maybe I'm going to plant half. Maybe I won't plant at all. Maybe I'll do this. People are starting to make adjustments, and it's going to get really tight squeeze because we're dealing with a lot of these global issues that are impacting us right here at home. And when you look at the cost, the price of fertilizer has gone up over 250%. So all of this adds up to a really complicated picture of uh, not just going to Publix or the grocery store and picking up, you know, your, your lettuce or your tomatoes or your onions, right? It's our, oper our, our producers operate off of market pricing, right? They can't just arbitrarily say, oh, well, fertilizer was up 250%, so I'm going to increase my prices by 250%. It doesn't work that way. So I think that's really important that people are cognizant of availability, one, and supply, but then also the pricing that goes along with it because that's gonna have a pass-through effect into other areas to an extent, but when it comes to agriculture, you can't exactly always pass along all of the input costs to the consumer because of the way that the industry is structured. So um, you have to wonder how many lumps can our producers take before they fold? It's not the only lump. Yeah. Another one they can't pass along is fuel, but really that one is affecting everyone. Everyone, across the board. Um, diesel prices have been so high um, that, that, of course, it's putting a squeeze on everyone. But I would also say the volatility um, has really been problematic because you look at people in the industry from just even your, your, your um your producers, then your processors, your packers, and once it's in that whole chain all the way up until retail, you've got people in, say, the trucking industry who they can't even really predict a fuel surcharge uh, price because it's swinging from 80 cents one day to then it's down 80 cents the next and then back up again. It's so volatile, it's really getting hard to make any sense of, of how to really do business in this space. And so the price is absolutely astronomical, 100%, and for no good reason. Um, but I think also the volatility, and that's a lot to do with the uncertainty here in Washington and the uncertainty in the global marketplace that's driving this. One 
other area of uncertainty, I'm pretty sure you've been following this, is labor. Mm. What are you watching? So, you know, this has been the ongoing conversation that we've had across the board for years about H-2A workers and, you know, how do we get uh, workers to, one, show up, uh, two, pass a background check if you do one, three, pass a drug test if you do one, um, you know, have legal papers. I mean, these are all things that uh, people in the real world deal with that politicians in Washington choose to ignore. Um, and it's really to our detriment because there's no reason why we cannot have a workable guest worker program that allows our, our producers to have a reliable workforce, right? And so one of the things that I'm very cognizant of is the effects of COVID and what that did. Um, one, we have a, a population here in the United States that is being paid to sit home and not work, right? And then of course you also see folks that are here illegally and they just wanna work and then go back home. And we're not being very accommodating to that. So I think something that we need to do is find a legal path forward for our guest workers who wanna come here, work, and go back home. They don't wanna be citizens, so let's not go down that path. And I think we need to actually have a workable program that makes sense for the industry. In Florida, for example, H-2A is not particularly popular because we have so many year-round industries and H-2A is only good for 10 months. And so we really need to think long-term about how can we accommodate and grow these critical industries because agriculture is, in fact, a national security issue. How do we accommodate and really bolster and support these industries that are of national security importance while making sense for the employer, but also for the employee? And so one of the things that we've been working on is this ad hoc working group with some colleagues that we wanna really take the approach of common sense, which I know common sense is not common, but taking this, this approach where we can actually facilitate um, an industry of, of labor that is well paid, um, that doesn't have uh, any of the crazy restrictions that we've seen under the Department of Labor with regard to, um, you know, you can't be, if you're, if you're on H-2A worker, you can't be fixing a tractor. You're kicked out of the program. I mean, that's ridiculous. Anybody who's worked a day on an operation knows that you are a jack of all trades and you could be cleaning toilets one day and picking the next and then uh, doing tech work the next. I mean, every you are you are wearing many hats. And so I think we need to have the legislation and the programs catch up to the times and the reality, quite frankly, of what agriculture is today. So that's a big issue in trying to find reliable labor and legal labor for our producers. You know, a common theme that, that you brought through there is regulation. Yeah. I just wonder, especially when it comes to the guest worker program, uh, with changes in administration, you'll always get changes in, in the way those regulations work. Is that being discussed that how do you write the legislation mm -hmm. so it's implemented the way it's intended? You know, I think that really gets to the heart of one of the big pieces of legislation that our team is championing, and that's the RAINS Act. You know, so many times Congress will pass laws uh, that when they get to the executive branch, all of a sudden they've turned into a completely different animal and they've become a monster in their own right, taking on a life of its own. And so I think there is actually the intent and the spirit of the law as it is written. And I think in so many cases, the intent was good. Um, but they've kind of taken some artistic freedoms and liberties when they get to the regulator side and the administrative side on what exactly that means. And so for us, the RAINS Act, which would effectively rein in um, the administration when it comes to these regulatory agencies, particularly when it, it hits about $100 million industry impact or more, it brings it back to Congress for an up or down vote on these rules and regulations, which I think is really critical because you can't fire bureaucrats in a basement in Washington. You can fire a member of Congress, but you can't fire a bureaucrat, and that's a problem. So we want to make sure that we're taking on the regulatory environment in a way that makes sense, that keeps consumers safe, that keeps workers safe, but doesn't strangle the employers and the industries that are just trying to do the right thing all along. And when you really step back and look at the data and the studies, so often industry is leading 
in terms of all of these safety initiatives and these these various, um, uh, I don't want to say regulations, but practices that they undertake just on their own because it makes them more competitive. So we should really stop relying on government to lead in this respect. We really should take our cues from industry. And I feel very confident that if we just get out of the way, things will be okay. <laughs> So good to see you. Thank you. The good time you. is is one of the most valuable resources yes. you have here. So thanks for taking a little bit of time to spend with us. Hey, okay, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Again, it's the Honorable Kat Kamek. She represents the third con congressional district of Florida. It's the best congressional district of Florida. That's right. On today's Agribusiness Report.